So welcome back. Um, I hope you all had a good lunch, but you didn't eat so much that you're going to fall asleep in the afternoon. Um, so this morning, we had an amazing discussion about the structural crisis that journalism and our media system faces and local strategies to solve that problem. Um, now we're going to pivot. And we're going to pivot towards the future of work and, importantly, the future of workers, with an emphasis on the latter. Um, and to connect this afternoon to the morning um, and to build on some of what Sarah said, what I also heard Caitlin say, it's really been exciting to watch this wave of unionization in, in journalism and on media platforms that's emerged over the last couple years. Um, and as to build on something Sarah, and I also heard Chen Jirai, Mark, what's really exciting and interesting to me is to see how that's going to impact journalism in and of itself. Well, how will journalism change? And in particular, how will journalists who have gone through the process, and this is something Sarah talked about in detail, how will journalists that have gone through the process of unionizing start to think about union issues in other places? Is this a moment that we can rebuild what is an extremely anemic labor press in this country? I, I'm hoping that one of the outcomes of that is that we have a whole new crop of journalists who start to think about these issues. And this is something that Mike Center takes very seriously and really wants to focus on moving forward, a space to think about labor journalism. Um, and that connects to unionization, but it's different than unionization, right? Um, to move to this afternoon on that, last night Naomi discussed the illegitimate business model of surveillance capitalism. She talked about the way Google and Facebook steal our data, particularly she was building off uh, uh, Shoshana Zuboff and Zuboff's arguments of this behavioral surplus that these companies have tried and have not even tried, have successfully monetized. Um, and it, she marks, and I think we all should really reflect on the fact that it's illegitimate, right? Um, and I want to extend that. We're going to be hearing about the platform economy, Uber, Lyft, et cetera, today. And so the on-demand platform economy operates in a very similar manner, right? And I want us to, to see that, right? That they consistently steal the data from workers and consumers, consistently, right? And they, and in England, actually, we're seeing in London some workers trying to fight back to get their data back, which is really exciting. And maybe we'll hear about this on one of the two panels coming back. But that's not the only way that they're, they're flouting the law. Like, they also are trying to roll back the social contract, right? Their imagination is that they can use these new business models to break and end collective bargaining rights, to end minimum wage as we know it, to stop folks in the US in particular from getting health care through their workplace and benefits. Um, so there's a lot of different things going on in, in this economy, and a lot of it is trying to get out in front where there are no laws in place and taking advantage of that or breaking the law when possible or necessary. And I want to like, give a, a, just a really quick example. Um, so when Uber entered the Philadelphia market, the ride share program of Uber, it was illegal. Ride sharing in Philadelphia was illegal in 2013 when Uber entered the market. Uber didn't care. They came anyway, and they didn't care so much. This is what's amazing, the hubris. They took out ads on municipal buses asking drivers to sign up to drive for Uber in Philadelphia while drive share, ride sharing was illegal. They just flouted the law, right? They didn't care. And then, so that's how they feel about the law, but then it's also their control over governments that I want to flag as we go into this. So, Cab drivers in this city and limo drivers in this city and people with disabilities all got together and fought back. They took Uber to court, the Court of Common Pleas in Philadelphia, and they sued them. And they won. They got an injunction. And Uber was no longer allowed to operate in the city. And they demanded that the regulatory body, the Philadelphia Parking Authority, actually uphold the law that they weren't allowed to drive here. They were, they were called a hack company. Um, and so what Uber then and Lyft quickly moved to do, because it was right before the Democratic National Convention in Philly, is they got in touch with all their friends in the Democratic Party, and the Democratic Party put immense amounts of pressure on the Pennsylvania legislature, and in the budget, in the Pennsylvania budget, they carved out this thing that has nothing to do with the budget that legalized rideshare in Philadelphia for six months, and in, so that there could be rideshare 
during the Democratic National Convention so that the, our, our great delegates could get around and get around conveniently, and Uber had this special place around the convention where they could bring their passengers. Um, and then ultimately, after six months, Uber and Lyft wrote a law that became the law of Pennsylvania, which then legalized Uber in Philadelphia. That's how these companies operate. That's what we're up against. And so this afternoon, we're going to mirror the discussions we've had this morning. We're going to start with a panel that thinks globally, structurally, about the questions facing workers, facing work, and facing labor in particular. Um, particularly in this transforming economy when there are companies that are making it difficult uh, to figure out their place. And then we'll have a second panel where we focus on local strategies to this new economy and the way workers are strategizing in this space. And, and I want to flag that the reason why we've structured it this way is because we really believe many of the best and most exciting solutions to the problems we face are happening at the local level. And sometimes we can take what those local strategies and we can make them national or beyond, but a lot of the best thinking is happening locally, and then we're we want to learn from that. So following those two panels, we'll have a last panel called uh, The Road Forward, I think it's called, and it's going to be an amazing group of folks that are going to uplift us a little bit, because we might need that at the end of the day. Um, and so that's going to be the structure for the afternoon. Um, but it is my great honor to get to um, introduce my colleague at Rutgers. We're very lucky to have her, uh, Dr. Khadija White. Hi, everyone. Um, we are going to do our best to keep you all awake uh, in this afternoon dip and to have a lively conversation. One of my first projects, um, I think my MA thesis at Annenberg, was working with Ellie Hugh Katz, emeritus professor on bureaucracy and technology and thinking about how technology has affected the way we think about work. So I'm kind of feeling full circle here right now. I'm glad we're going to be able to have this conversation. So I'm just going to introduce the panel, um, and they're going to give you a line about themselves, so I'm not going to do their bios, and you can also read their bios, um, but I'm going to just kind of introduce them. So we have here um, at the end, Jamie Woodcock, researcher at Oxford Institute, Internet Institute, um, Ben Tarnoff, the editor for Logic Magazine, um, Alexandria Ravenel, assistant professor of sociology at Mercer, Mercy College, and a visiting scholar at Institute for Public Knowledge at NYU, um, and last but not least, Stephen Lerner, um, a fellow at Georgetown University's Kalmanovich in Initiative for Labor in the Working Poor. Okay. Um, we're going to be talking today about the changing conditions of work that emerged over the last few decades uh, and the possibilities of building worker power and creating social change in this new Uber Lyft system. Okay, thanks. Well, thank you so much uh, for the invitation to come and speak here. Um, we joked about saying an interesting fact. Uh, to introduce ourselves, and you know, what I, I'm not going to go for an interesting fact, but um, one of the things that I do, so I'm an ethnographer uh, by training, uh, and I study work, um, and I think one of the, the semi-interesting facts that I'm going to go with is I think that as academics, we need to think long and hard about our role in relationship to the people we study in a similar way to how journalists have to think about it. And so in addition to the academic uh, work that I do, uh, I also publish... Uh, and, and help to edit uh, a kind of online journal about workers' struggles called Notes from Below. Um, and a number of the gig economy struggles that have happened in the UK, um, we've featured from a kind of ground-up perspective, um, from an understanding that, you know, from academics in, uh, in institutions might be able to go and interview people and so on. But what we really need is the voices of the people from these struggles to come through. Um, and one of the kind of proudest parts of this project that we've had so far is to focus, work, uh, to, to focus and publish workplace bulletins. So workers describing their own struggles, whether they're delivery drivers, uh, cleaners, academic workers, having a space where they can publish their own stories about the struggles that they're going through. And I think this is particularly important for, for what I want to talk about today, which is about how work is changing. Um, so in the UK, I do... Uh, a lot of research with, uh, with a union called the IWGB, which I'm not going to steal any of Jason's thunder uh, for the last panel. But what I want to do is to give you a couple of examples about how gig work 
is changing how people work. And then I also want to make an argument about how we should be, how we should be talking about gig work. And this starts in 2016 when we had the first uh, strike of delivery riders, arguably one of the first strikes in the platform uh, economy. And I got involved with it because I'd been uh, writing about call center workers and struggles in call centers. And I, I basically had enough of doing that. I'd, I'd published a book. I wanted to, to, to look at some other kinds of work. And somebody said to me, you should come and meet some of these delivery workers. Um, you, know, you should come along and meet some of them. In, in London, they were becoming ubiquitous sites outside of restaurants and so on. And so we came along and we got talking to these young workers, uh, many of them who were migrant workers, who were delivering food and so on. And after a couple of weeks, they launched their first strike. Uh, which was an incredibly impressive moment uh, of resistance. You know, many of these workers had no protection from a traditional trade union, but chose to go on strike over a whole week. Um, and this was really a turning point. It was a turning point for many people because it showed that behind the app, there were people who were doing work who were delivering our food. And I want to tell a couple of the stories from people I met along, uh, uh, along the way. And there's one in particular. Um, He's a young worker, he delivered for, uh, food for delivery, uh, but also had a sociology degree uh, and was quite interested in writing about his own work. Um, so we published a paper together uh, about understanding his work, about the role of the city and so on. And during one of the interviews I had with him, I said, you know, we've never discussed what the hardest bit of your job is. And he kind of paused for a minute and he said, the hardest bit of my job is I get up in the morning, and I usually try and have some breakfast, but I'm not a big fan of eating in the morning. So I go off to my first job. It gets to lunchtime. I try and have a sandwich, but then I deliver other people's food over lunchtime. I then go back to work in my third job, and I work through to the evening. I try and have some food, and I then deliver other people's food over dinner time. He said, the hardest thing for me is when I get back home after doing that whole cycle, both literally and figuratively of that work. The hardest thing for me is cooking enough calories to eat to be able to go out and do the whole thing again the next day. And I think within that anecdote, there is a kind of damning indictment of the gig economy that, you know, despite the advertising of Deliveroo and so on, of bringing smashed avocado on toast to well-off millennials who are kind of relaxing on a, on a weekday, is mostly he delivered food to people who were too tired to cook for themselves, and he himself was then too tired to cook for himself. So we can see how these platforms both overwork the people involved in them, but also support the overwork of many of the rest of us. You know, they're not a huge benefit that you know, we're getting to enjoy, but often are used to, to make us work more and more. And over the past year, um, I've been working on a project looking at gig work in different countries. And I think what's most remarkable about the growth of these platforms whether it's Deliveroo in the UK, uh, Uber Eats in parts of Europe, Fedora, uh, Zwiggy in India, is how similar the stories from gig workers are, the things that people tell you. Is they talk about the danger of cycling on the roads. They talk about these similar challenges of you know, the exhaustion of, uh, of cycling food. But what they often talk about is pay, 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 and pay. And so when you talk to a Zwiggy worker in Bangalore and you ask them about what their problems are, they say, well, I like this job. It's flexible. I can choose to work when I want. But I'm not paid enough, so I have to work all of the time. You talk to an Uber Eats driver in South Africa. They say, this job is flexible. I get to choose whenever I work, but it's not paid enough. I don't get enough money. The drop rates go down. But I think what's interesting about the growth of these platforms is you're starting to have a common experience of work for workers in very different parts of the world. And I think the experience of gig work is very different in the global south and the global north. For many people in the global north, it's experienced as a degradation of working conditions, losing those union jobs, losing that stability, losing some of those rights. Whereas for many people in the global south, the outcomes are the same, low pay and so on, but people are coming out of the informal sector and so may not have experienced those kinds of uh, employment conditions before. But I could never have imagined five, ten years ago getting into the back of a cab in Bangalore 
and having a driver want to know about what was happening with Uber drivers in London. You know, were they going to have a strike? What were they going to do next? Or in South Africa, people asking if rates were different in other parts of the world, if people had been able to win something. And so the argument that I want, that I want to make now is that we need to move on from talking about the challenges of the gig economy, that these, this work is low paid, it's stressful, it's difficult, and instead start to talk about the ubiquity of resistance that's beginning to happen in these sectors. And what I found so surprising uh, is spending, I spent a couple of months in Bangalore talking to gig workers, is there was no coverage really of strike action of gig workers in Bangalore. The first gig worker I spoke to outside of a restaurant, we had to have some translation because uh, you know, many of the, the delivery drivers don't speak English. We said to them, have you ever been in a union? And they said, no, we've never been in a union. I thought, okay, this is one of the stories that comes out in the gig economy. I said, have you ever been involved in a strike? He said, yeah, yeah, last week. I said, oh, okay, so what, what happened? He said, oh, 400 of us went on strike. We won, the manager came and talked to us. They said, we'll pay you more, fuel prices have gone up. I said, all right, has that happened before? He said, yes, this is the third time we've done that. And there had been no local coverage of these strikes happening. And increasingly, in India at least, managers join the WhatsApp groups that have spread up across the world of all of these drivers and start to try and mediate so these strikes don't grow. But what it means for many of these workers is they've gone through processes of organizing. They've built networks of other delivery drivers. They've made demands. Similarly, in South Africa, in Johannesburg, we spoke to drivers who, again, said they'd never been in a union. We asked them if they'd had a strike. They said, yeah, we've had a kind of strike. You know, we won something two months ago. Uh, we called a strike over fuel prices and over road safety. We said, all right, so how did you organize it? They said, well, if we caught people driving, we'd push them off their motorbikes and we'd smash the motorbikes up so they wouldn't work anymore. <laughs> they said, all right, that sounds like that's quite a, a kind of militant tactic. And the guy said, no, no, that's, that's, that's democracy. You know, if we decide to do it, we all do it together. <laughs> and these are the kinds of stories that unless you talk to people who are doing this work, you would never have seen this covered in the press. And I think what this means is, when we look at the gig economy, which has been an incredibly high profile and interesting sector, it is alive with resistance, whether here in the US, with the organizing recently in the UK, in uh, Latin America recently too, there is resistance alive in these kinds of workplaces that often is just beginning to bubble above the surface. The organizing, the networking, the, the kind of nascent strikes and so on. And so what I want to finish on, um, partly because I have a book out about Marxism and video games and the video games work are organizing called Marx at the Arcade, is to say that there are lessons that can be learned from these new moments of organizing to say that many people said gig work would be impossible or incredibly difficult to organize in. They said management has figured out a way to stop people organizing. Thank you. But what we've seen with the video game workers, and I think there's an important link here to journalism too, is when, gig work, uh, when video game workers started organizing, they got incredibly good coverage from the video games press, mainly because these were unionized workplaces that were supportive of what was happening. And what we've seen over the course of a year is a group of workers who have never been in unions before, many of them didn't know what unions were, with the support uh, of an international network help spread through journalism, have started to make their first steps towards organizing uh, in what we could consider to be a very new and, uh, and different sector. And I think what both cases show us is that work is clearly changing, and people are finding new ways to organize within that work. And whether we're academics or journalists or practitioners, we have to think about what our practice does to support people in these different sectors. To think about ways that we can collaborate, we can share knowledge and tactics and, and skills and so on. To think about how we can reshape the future of work. Because it's not some kind of imaginary thing that floats in the, in the near future, but it's something that is enacted right now, and we too can play a part in shaping that. Thank you.
everybody. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Uh, thanks so much for including me. Thank you to Victor and Todd for making this possible. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm Ben. I'm a tech worker. I'm a writer. Uh, I help edit a magazine about technology called Logic. And in my capacity at Logic, but also as a tech worker, I've been both observing and participating in a variety of the tech worker movements that have proliferated over the past couple years. So that's what I wanted to speak to you briefly about uh, in the next 12 minutes or so. It's kind of a different angle because these are the workers who are helping to build many of the technologies that are in turn transforming the conditions of work of other workers. Um, so it's an important but, but somewhat different angle on the subject. Uh, I thought I would give just a very rough and incomplete overview of the range of different mobilizations that are happening. Um, tech workers are taking collective action at a number of different fronts, across a number of different roles, across a number of different companies. Um, very broadly, I think we are absolutely living through an, an unprecedented historical moment. In that regard, the tech industry is historically not a uh, very fertile ground for collective action. Um, there have been a number of failed attempts at unionization. So it's, it's a really exciting time, and it's actually kind of reached a velocity where it's hard to keep up on everything that's happening week to week. I actually really struggle with it. What's cool about the range of actions is they're happening across so many different roles. So there are full-time workers in tech, there are contract workers, there are workers who occupy what we would consider white collar, occupy what we would consider blue collar, technical and non-technical. Um, so it's a, it's a really kind of complex and diverse phenomenon. If we had to like assign a few categories, so I'll give a very schematic overview. Again, I apologize for its incompleteness. Uh, one relates to very concrete issues of wages and working conditions. So one category of tech worker are the folks who occupy the service roles, um, typically like support service roles on the big Silicon Valley campuses. These might be folks who work as security guards, food service workers, shuttle bus drivers. Over the past few years, thousands of them have won better wages, working conditions, and a voice on the job by unionizing. Unions like Unite Here, uh, the Teamsters, and SEIU have been very active in Silicon Valley around these issues. Another source of that type of kind of concrete workplace issue organizing has come from subcontracted workers more broadly. So subcontracted workers don't just include those folks who are in those service roles, but a lot of what we would consider white collar roles as well. Um, Google, more than half of their workforce are contract workers. And this includes people who are writing software, who are doing product design, who are doing marketing. Um, so that's really important to keep in mind as well. Um, and recently, a lot of organizing efforts by these so-called white collar contract workers have won real concessions. Um, there, were, there was a recent case at Google um, regarding that. So if that's broadly one bucket, another bucket um, might be the social harms of technologies. And I think broadly, this is probably the one that's received the most media attention. There have been a number of contracts and specific technologies that tech workers have organized internal campaigns around. Uh, Naomi last night mentioned Project Maven. That was probably the highest profile one. Project Maven is an ongoing DOD project to use machine learning to identify targets for drone strikes. Google was engaged in that contract and a sustained year-long internal organizing effort by Google workers got management to agree not to renew the contract, which is a really big victory. It happened in summer 2018. So that was, I think, the moment where a lot of the tech worker organizing broke into public attention. There was a lot of media coverage of that in particular. But there have been smaller uh, initiatives as well um, at places like Amazon, Microsoft, and Salesforce around the issues of contracts with ICE, contracts with CBP. At Amazon, there was an effort in particular um, to ask the company to stop selling facial recognition software to local law enforcement. Um, so there's, there's a whole bunch of mobilizing, again, broadly around the kind of social harms of technologies. The last thing I would mention on that front, just because it's very recent, is a letter by at this point, more than, I think, 5,000 Amazon workers um, specifically demanding that Bezos develop a plan to move Amazon off of fossil fuels. 
the cloud in general is, is very dirty. It uses a lot of electricity and it also produces a lot of heat because all those computers in big warehouses produce an enormous amount of heat. Um, and if that weren't bad enough, a lot of the major cloud providers, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, are heavily courting uh, big oil companies because there's a variety of ways one can use machine learning to intensify extraction, identify new sites for extraction. So there's this emergence of a pretty large number of Amazon employees who are pushing for a different kind of climate orientation within the company. At Amazon, that's, I think, particularly impressive because unlike a place like Google, um, let's say that the culture is maybe not as accommodating of that kind of uh, internal dissent. The last category I would mention um, is tech workers organizing to demand safe and equitable workplaces, free from all forms of gendered and racialized harassment and oppression. Um, probably the biggest example of this, again, one that got a lot of media attention was the Google walkout. I think Naomi mentioned that as well last night. And this was a, a, really a massive event. We had 20,000 Google workers, both full-time and contract workers, in some 50 offices worldwide. Uh, by some measure may have been the kind of biggest labor action in modern history. Um, the proximate trigger for this was a New York Times story about Andy Rubin, one of the creators of Android, who uh, received this massive exit package and a number of credible, credible claims of sexual harassment against him were hushed up uh, by Google management. So there's a lot of other stuff going on. Um, there's also a lot of stuff that is not in the media spotlight. Um, and there's a lot of folks who are doing this work who are not in the media spotlight because, of course, it's, it's not safe for everyone to be out in front on these issues. So I, I, would, I would mention just kind of how incomplete this overview is. Um, there's a lot of more detail we could add to that picture, but I thought I would just pull back and make a couple of general observations about some of the themes that, that I, I've seen both as a participant and an observer uh, of these movements. So I think the first one, and the one I think that's really important to make, because it's not always super intuitive, is that all of these different struggles are connected. As I mentioned, they are taking place at a range of companies, across a range of roles, around a range of different issues. But there really is a deep connective tissue that binds them. And that issue, very broadly construed, is the issue of worker control that workers in different workplaces are demanding more control over the conditions of their work, how their workplaces are organized and run, and crucially, what they work on, which in the case of many tech workers is extremely consequential work for everybody else, because these technologies have such incredible social consequence. Towards that end, I think it's very significant that one of the recurring demands by Google organizers across a variety of different struggles has been the demand for a worker representative on the company board, which would have reflect, I think, a small but meaningful step towards a degree of workplace democracy. Now, that can seem like a somewhat theoretical point, but I think the connective tissue that I'm describing is also really happening on the ground. So, and to me, that's the second theme that I would highlight and probably the most inspiring of what I think is, is broadly a very inspiring moment, which is the relationships and the solidarity that is being built across different roles, across different companies. Um, you've seen this again, full-time workers and contract workers, white collar workers and blue collar workers, learning from one another, kind of pooling their skills and capacities, and together kind of developing an analysis, um, which is really powerful. You've seen on the one hand a fair bit of continuity uh, across these different struggles, so core organizers who are participating in the struggle against Project Maven. Many of those same folks were also participating in the struggle against Dragonfly, which is the censored search engine that Google is probably still building um, for the Chinese government, um, and similarly for the Google walkout. So kind of from a personnel perspective, there's a lot of continuity um, there. I think the last piece of solidarity I, I draw attention to is that folks are also drawing inspiration from labor struggles in society more broadly. So in the Google walkout statement, organizers referred specifically to McDonald's workers taking action against sexual harassment by bosses in their workplaces and that they were inspired by that example. A uh, Googler 
who I interviewed, who was active in the anti-Maven organizing, mentioned specifically the teacher strikes and how inspiring that was as a model of organizing. Um, so, th so these folks are very much aware of developments that are happening in the wider labor movement and wider social movements and drawing inspiration from it. And I, and I, I think why it's been so inspiring to see is that it, it also becomes such a great engine of mobilization, finding this common identity around workers. I think, Sarah, in the, in the last panel, you had mentioned this, that when workers think of themselves as workers, they discover the capacity to relate to one another as workers. It's an incredibly powerful, um, unifying tool, and, uh, and you can win a lot more with it. Uh, just to kind of provide a very brief um, example of that, I thought I would just read a super short passage from a open letter that an Uber employee wrote um, in solidarity with gig workers rising and rideshare drivers united who are, there are a couple of important groups doing gig worker organizing called for a strike of, of gig workers in California recently. And this Uber employee wrote, as tech workers, we share more in common with the drivers that support the platform than the company executives that spend millions ensuring that rideshare companies and others in the so-called gig economy can continue to bend the law and exploit workers. So that's a, a really powerful example, of, I think, of that type of solidaristic thinking and kind of a, a brilliant moment of kind of class composition more generally that gives me a lot of hope. Um, I think I have a variety of thoughts also that we could discuss if folks are interested in, in the conversation about where this came from. I think it has a lot to do with a wave of a politicization that happens in the aftermath of the Trump election. Um, and I think there's a lot of interesting things to explore there. But I'll, I'll leave it um, there for now. Thank you. Hi. Oh, I love microphones. Sorry. Um, I'm Alexandria Ravenel. Uh, I guess my little tidbit is that I'm the author of Hustle and Gig, Struggling and Surviving in the Sharing Economy, which was just published last month by the University of California. Ooh. Thank you. And you just published a baby two weeks ago. I, that's actually my next line, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, so it is really great to be here. Uh, I started my career actually in journalism. I was supposed to be a reporter, and then the dot-com bust happened, and yeah, that went away. Um, and then I ended up moving into sociology. Um, and my interest in the gig economy actually came out of that interest in sort of media and then moving into inequality. Um, so just like with Sarah, this meeting really felt like it was perfect for me. It kind of brought everything together. So thanks to Todd and Victor and also to Breyer. Um, so I live in New York City. And two weeks ago today, I was actually in the throes of very active labor um, and in the backseat of a lift. And all I could think between contractions, which I do not recommend having in the backseat of a car, um, is that I could not be the gig economy researcher who gave birth in a rideshare vehicle. <laughs> um, especially not during Friday rush hour. Um, and I also couldn't be the person who had their water break in a lift, because uh, I wasn't certain what the cleanup fee was, but I was pretty certain it was not covered by my insurance. Um, so I made it to the hospital on time. Uh, I didn't leave any bodily fluids behind, much to my relief and that of the driver. Um, but that experience also really illustrates some of the risks that are associated in the gig economy. Um, and it really also illustrates two of the major changes that have been brought around by the gig economy. We have seen a transformation of risk from companies to individuals. And in addition with that, we have also seen that workers are experiencing a high level of the unknown every time they walk into any type of gig work. Um, in my book, Hustle and Gig, um, I talk about how the gig economy is a movement forward to the past, whereby workers lose access to generations of hard-won workplace protections, that they are actually worse off than their great-grandparents were, which is sort of a sad commentary on the situation of work. 
Now, this idea of a risk shift uh, in sociology actually comes from Hacker and his concept of risk being shifted from corporations to workers. And he actually talks a lot about how this has been in sort of the larger society. It's not just in the gig economy. He talks about how people have moved from pensions into 401ks, where the risk of a bad investment and being poor in retirement is actually on individuals and not on the companies. And also where we've seen a move towards high deductible health insurance, where the risk of medical bankruptcy is going to be on the workers as opposed to something that companies are going to experience. <laughs> but those risks, although I don't want to minimize them, are long-term risks. Those are future risks. Those are things that we can sort of forget about sometimes. But the risks that are in the gig economy are daily risks. And so I call this a risk transformation. It's not just about a risk that you might experience something five years down the road or 10 or 20 years, but it's a risk that you might experience something awful today at work. And those risks are going to be incredibly varied risk. Those risks include slow periods where there simply is no work, and so workers aren't able to make any money. The risks of damage to their personal property or risk of damage to themselves, physical injuries. It also includes the risk of experiencing sexual harassment or sexually uncomfortable experiences at work and the risk of being involved in criminal or criminally questionable activity through one's gig work. And because of the inequality that arises with individuals working in the gig economy, they find themselves trapped in these situations Oops. and unable to escape them. Um, it was actually a story about this criminal, criminally questionable activity that brought me to studying the gig economy. I. I believed the original myth that uh, the gig economy was entrepreneurship for the masses. And for several years before I started studying it, I actually was hiring TaskRabbits to do administrative work. I had a small consulting business and I was adjuncting for a lot of places. And then one day I started talking to my, uh, my TaskRabbit. And in the book, uh, his pseudonym is Jamal. And I started saying, you know, Jamal, it's great. You're an entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur, you know, this entrepreneurial system. And he starts telling me about a task where he was hired to pick up someone's prescription. And he thinks this is a perfectly normal task. He goes to the local Dwayne Reed, the drugstore, he picks up the prescription. And then the woman calls and says, by the way, I moved to China. And I forgot to pick up my prescription. OK, well, that's an interesting thing to have forgotten, but all right. Um, and then she says, oh, I need you to mail the prescription to China. Um, and then it turns out that the drugs he's picking up are actually a large bottle of amphetamines. And he looks at these, and he's like, well, I'm pretty certain I'm not supposed to mail prescription drugs across international borders. He is right. <laughs> so he calls to ask Rabbit, and he says, what do I do? And the person at the task grab it says, let me get back to you on that. I need to look into this. And then uh, speaks to him again and says, well, you know, this violates our rules, but the customer's always right. You should mail these drugs. Um, and Jamal, who has a sociology degree, there's a theme here with sociology degrees. I'm a little concerned. Um, he thinks I'm not going to possibly ruin my future, getting caught mailing this controlled substance across international borders. So he decides he's not going to do that. And for a week, he carries around a large bottle of amphetamines in his backpack. And fortunately, stop and frisk has stopped at that point. Um, but they're still checking people's bags when they try and get on the subway. And so he hopes he doesn't get stopped by the police. Because as he puts it, how am I going to explain this? I'm a contract worker. No one is going to protect me on this. And eventually, the woman gets back in touch and puts him in contact with somebody. And he hands off the drugs in a local park, which is an equally problematic image. And I hear this story from him, and all I can think is, well, this doesn't really sound like the type of entrepreneurship I thought it was going to be. I mean, there's an aspect of entrepreneurship, but not the legal type. Um, and it, 
This prompted me to start looking at the experience of the workers and to really focus on their stories. And I found that stories like Jamal's, although sensational, are actually not that unusual. That these workers are very much experiencing a number of risks for their physical, their legality, um, in terms of just their overall experience at work. You know, there's a lot of attention to how, whether or not clients are protected. You know, is your Uber driver background checked? Uh, do you know who's coming into your home as a task rabbit? But what that focus on the users does is it ignores the fact that for the workers, they have no idea who they are working for. That the rise of this peer-to-peer -peer economy partnered with these apps makes it very possible for workers to be working for entirely anonymous individuals. They have no idea who they are going to be encountering and what types of experiences. And when they're working behind closed doors in someone's home, we see fairly predictable results. And so workers told me about being injured on the job. One young woman who I refer to in the book as being like Tinkerbell. She's about 100 pounds, maybe five feet tall. She actually finds herself getting hired for moving tasks because people think that she has a pretty <laughs> desirable rate. It's fairly affordable. And she ends up popping pain, kill, pain pills each night in order to sleep because she's getting injured on the job and there's no other option. And she's even hesitant to give up these moving jobs and these cleaning jobs even after medical advice is that she stops because these are the jobs that are actually providing her some money. And the things that she thought she'd be able to do in the gig economy are not actually options. And workers tell about being exposed to dangerous chemicals, contractor-worthy chemicals, being asked to clean out ponds where they're not given any gloves or scoops. They just have to take off their shoes and socks and climb into a moldy fish pond that actually gives the worker nightmares years later. We also see that workers find themselves in what they refer to as sexually uncomfortable experiences. And so with the gig economy, we don't just see sexual harassment, but we see actually a loss of political language about sexual harassment. So because these workers are independent contractors and they've been told that they are outside workplace protections, that they do not qualify for these things, they start to internalize it. And so I've met workers who've told me that they've been invited to participate in threesomes. They go to cook somebody a meal and apparently they think something else is on the table too. Um, or workers who have actually been touched by their clients, individuals who have literally thrown themselves at the worker and demanded sexual activity. Um, we've also, I've also talked to workers who found themselves working swingers parties and sex parties and are never entirely certain how to handle the situation. Because they're being rated and ranked and reviewed, they don't know how to walk out of it without being very delicate and trying to be, well, you know, I have another task I need to take care of, so next time, maybe. Um, and then, of course, we've also had workers like Jamal who found themselves involved in criminal activity. So there's an Uber driver that I spoke to who I call Hector, and Hector actually finds himself uh, serving as a getaway driver for a group of drug dealers and they are just telling him to go from one spot to another, and somebody's jumping out, and they're doing the little handshake and passing stuff off. And then in the end, after about two hours of driving them around, he wants to go home. And they say, no, no, not yet. Give us your phone number. And he thinks about this for a minute, because he doesn't know, as he puts it, he doesn't even have a pen to defend, to defend himself. They could have knives, they could have guns, he doesn't know. He gives them the right phone number, which is probably good, because then they call it and make sure the phone number actually works. And then they call him again in the future and find out if he will take them around. And he's able to fortunately beg off, but in that moment, he doesn't really know how to escape the situation. Um, you know, one of the things that often comes up, and we're hearing a lot of great attention to this by the other panelists, is what can be done about this? And the solution I keep coming back to is that we actually have many protections for these workers. It's called being a W-2 employee. 
And there's no reason why these platforms have to make these workers independent contractors. They call themselves technology platforms, and yet that's really just a way to hide what's really going on. It's the example I always give is it's like the VCR of the 1980s. We call it technology, no one knows how to set the time on it, and we just get used to it. And yet the same thing happens with the gig economy. When it gets called a technology company or transportation company or logistics or an accommodations marketplace, the fact and reality of what's going on with the workers gets forgotten. But if all these workers were considered W-2 employees, they would have the legal right to organize and to do strikes, and they would have many more protections. So, thank you. Hi, everybody. There's benefits of going last, and there's problems, which is a lot of what I was going to say has been said, so I'm going to wing it a little bit here. Let me, before I start, ask you all, like, who here has heard of the Justice for Janitors campaign? Okay. And who's heard about bargaining for common good? Okay, I can just leave. No, but anyway, um, first, we're supposed to say something interesting, I guess, about the past. And one of the things that's interesting to me is that in the 80s and 90s, we organized all the janitors in Silicon Valley at Apple, at all those companies. And it was this great irony that the subcontracted outsourced janitors were the only people unionized in all of the valley. And we actually ran into the problem in negotiations that the wages of janitors started to be as high or higher as some of the low-wage assembly workers, and it created an interesting tension. But I wanted to, I'm going to talk about three things quickly. One is some lessons from justice for janitors that might apply to this. Second is why we should talk about the future of workers and never say the word future of work again. And third, talk a little bit about how bargaining for common good might wrap in, organizing and bargaining for good, um, common good, a bunch of things people are saying here. But the key thing on janitors, when we started organizing janitors, everybody said, in the 80s, you can't organize janitors. They're part-time, they're subcontracted, they're undocumented. There was an unending list of why it was impossible. And the issue wasn't whether workers wanted a union. The issue was the industry was structured in a way, which is a work for subcontractors, that even if workers wanted a union, even if they won the union through the absurd, and this is where I challenge you a little bit, even if you're a legal employee of somebody, the law is so screwed up that it's impossible to organize even if you are an employee in this country, if you follow the legal mechanisms. But going back to the point I wanted to get to is that everybody said it was impossible, and it would have been impossible if we said the only thing we're doing is organizing janitors to challenge the person who signs their paycheck. Because the cleaning contractor was part, just like Uber and Platform, was part of a purposeful, purposeful system created to say that the actual employer had no money to pay janitors more because they work on a small profit margin. And if you organized a cleaning contractor and made them pay more, what would the building owner do to the cleaning contractor? This is where it's participatory. Would the building owner give them more money or would they get rid of them? Come on, you all ate lunch, but wake up, be with me here now. <laughs> so we had a very simple idea, which has guided a lot of our thinking, which is who signs the paycheck is not the primary issue that we need an analysis up the power tree of who ultimately has money and power. And I'm giving you, instead of the four-hour janitor history, the one-minute version of it. And what we realized that if we targeted the building owner, the entity that hired the janitor, and if we then looked at all the pension funds and financiers that gave them money, that we then were targeting the people that had wealth and power. And if we could build sufficient pressure, which I won't, don't have time to go through, we could not only win the union, but we could double and triple wages. And so that shaped a lot of my thinking. And the key thing about janitors, what we always said in the 80s, is if you look at the poorest workers, if you look at workers of color, if you look at immigrant workers, it's a window into all of our futures. And so what was new then, which was subcontracting, getting rid of insurance, part-timing, has become the norm in all of the economy, because capitalism experiments first with the weakest folks. Now, one of the ironies is in many cities, janitors now have a union and pension and health insurance, and workers who used to be regular workers no longer have that. But the key thing I want to pull out of this is the idea that we had to have an analysis of who had power 
and then how to beat them, and not be constrained by what the law says. And the biggest lesson we learned in Justice for Janitors was anything that works for workers is either illegal or will be made illegal. So almost everything we did was, at minimum, extra legal, but massive civil disobedience, shutting down highways, et cetera, et cetera. So that was 30 years of life. Um, and then it takes us this thing that everybody said, like this new thing happened as people were getting to. The future of work, that some mythical thing is happening, changing the world, and there's nothing we can do about it. And we just all have to go along with the new world of work that's been created and all these fantasies about workers will disappear and robots will take over and all this stuff. And that sounds pretty bad. But the whole idea behind it is, is it's, it's just, the plane of history. There's nothing we can do about it. And so what a lot of us have been thinking about is if instead of, if we ask a dis different question, what is the future of workers? And if we then say there's three interrelated sub-questions, which is what's the future, well, the, I, not a sub, three questions, which is one is what's the future of workers? What's going on with inequality and democracy? That these three things are intertwined and you can't address the future of workers, and you can't address inequality, and you can't address democracy unless you think of them all together. And the key part of that is that all this stuff that I'm sure you've been talking about the whole conference, that there is a teeny group of company and people that increasingly control everything. And concentration of wealth and power, blah, blah, blah. We've talked about the hero already, right? I can skip that? Good, I'll save a minute. But the, so if instead of thinking about future of work or technology, if instead we think about control of capital and who owns capital and who dominates it, then it leads us to a different set of questions, including things that we said about control of work and how we do that. And so what we started to think a lot about <clears throat> is let's think about People might have called it the commanding heights once. I don't know if we say that anymore. But anyway, what's running the economy, and how do we fight those folks? And so as we've started to think about future of work, workers, what we're saying is let's look at, at the highest level, where wealth and power are concentrated. And what's fascinating about that is that increasingly, it's, it's not surprising, but it's the same people, literally. Has anybody here heard of the Blackstone Corporation, private equity company? Okay, they, I think they, oh God, I'm trying to remember whether it's 500 billion or whatever, they're, they're enormous. They employ 500,000 people. They are also the largest landlord in America now. They also simultaneously are, just gave MIT some enormous money, amount of money because they're investing in AI. But the thing about Blackstone and many of these companies is they are extracting from all parts of our life. They're not just an employer. They're also a landlord. They're also an investor. They're also a private equity company. So when we look at the economy, what we increasingly see is a smaller and smaller group of monopolies that are controlling all different parts of our life. So it seems that just as in janitors, we had to think about the building owners, whether we're doing gig organizing, whether we're doing traditional worker organizing, whoever we're organizing, we have to have analysis of who really has power. And that rarely, and control, going back to this whole question of shifting control, that rarely is who signs our paycheck anymore. And so, how, much, how am I doing on time here? Uh, you got a little bit. Oh, good, I have so much to say. And so what that's led us to say is, you can sort of abstractly say, oh, well, let's go after capital, or let's try to get control of capital, and that's kind of daunting. <laughs> so we've launched a campaign called bargaining for Co Organizing and Bargaining for Common Good. And it's based on some very simple ideas, which is, first of all, that workers have whole lives, that we shouldn't just think about what happens at work. If you make more money at work, but then your rent goes up so much that you have to live 200 miles, I'm exaggerating, you have to live 100 miles away, that's a problem. If the schools think, that's a problem. And what we've tended to do in the labor movement is have a single focus on wages and benefits, which is important, but insufficient, and actually is not where the labor movement started. The labor movement in this country was built in the campaign for industrial democracy. And that's why I say this question of democracy, worker power, and inequality are all completely intertwined. So the basic idea on bargaining for common good is that at the time of weakness for unions, that instead of narrowing the scope of what we bargain and fight for, we have to radically expand it. And that if we let it get smaller, we both won't win, and there's really no reason to join. So what we've said in Bargaining for Common Good is, and then the second thing we say is, 
who we're bargaining with, whether it's a school district or whether it's a building owner, is not necessarily who has power. So we always have to have an analysis of who's really in charge at the top and aim for them. And so what we've started to do in bargaining for common good is going to the bargaining table with community groups and racial justice groups and adding all sorts of things to the bargaining table that you never bargained for. And we do this not as a substitute for wages. We actually do better on winning wages when we make the fight about what we're bargaining and organizing for about the entire community. So a simple example, St. Paul teachers, they negotiated that the school district would do no work, would not bank with any bank that foreclosed during the school year. Simple idea, pretty dramatic, but the school district refused to bargain. For those who know labor law, it's not a mandatory subject. They said you can't do that. When they brought 100 parents to the bargaining table and the school district said, we won't bargain about wh why you're losing your homes, it totally flipped that. So I want to give two, three specific examples about bargaining for common good that will help illustrate this. So who knows the teacher strike in LA? People have heard about this. If you really look at what they were doing, first, it was a four-year campaign to radically re and there's a woman named Sarah Jaffe who may know a little bit about this. You can read her. I'm going to summarize her eight articles very quickly. Okay, I'll do it quick. But the key thing about it was they bargained. The reason they won is because they were bargaining about green space, sanctuary schools. They were bargaining about no um, cert random searches of backpacks. It became a community fight. But the thing a lot of people don't know is the real people they were fighting is what they call the billionaire private privatizers. It wasn't about the school board. It was about that whole set of billionaires that have spent years trying to privatize the public, public goods. And that's what the fight ultimately was and why they won. And that's part of a realm of work all over the country. In LA, we did something called Fix LA, where we were bargaining the city contract. And one of the things we won was that all new workers being hired would be hired from disadvantaged communities. It's again was saying our goal isn't just to get a little bit more money, it's to fundamentally transform the relationship. And the other example I give, I don't know if anybody's heard about the um, Committee for Better Banks and the bank worker organizing. But here's the exciting thing about it. We're organizing bank workers in the United States as part of a global campaign. Ironically, I'm going to go over my time when I tell this. Um, it was spawned by the Brazilian Bank Workers Union that said they cannot maintain their level of unionization and wages when low-wage countries like the United States were threatening their standards. It's a very interesting meeting to be in that as a, somebody from here. But we have two key components of the campaign. One is traditional, three components. How do you treat and pay workers? Second, that workers don't want to cheat consumers as a condition of employment. And third, that the finance system is basically corrupt and bad. So instead of just saying to the banks, well, if you pay us a little more, you can continue to rob people, we were the, which is what the traditional labor focus has been. As long as you pay us decently, you can pollute, you can do whatever. That failed. That model of collective bargaining, which is a partnership where you can destroy the world if a small segment of the working class is compensated decently, they won't even let us do that anymore. We can't even make that bad deal. They just want to destroy us. So instead of trying to go backwards and make the old bad deal, which was a bad deal, what we're saying is let's make a, a different approach. And so in the banking work, we are campaigning simultaneously for workers and consumers and to break up the big banks. And for those who didn't follow it, Tim Sloan, the head of uh, Wells Fargo, was just gotten rid of because workers were the whistleblowers on the cheating scandal. Bank of America just raised the minimum wage for bank workers to $20 an hour, $41,000 a year, because we've been campaigning in that. But the reason the campaign has traction is because we're not saying this is just about workers' conditions. We're saying that workers have sales goals and all the things that you were referencing that they can only meet their quotas if they cheat people for a living. So what I'd end with is that what we're trying to say is let's not talk about the future of work. Let's not talk about sort of this idea that we have no rights or powers because we're not employees. Let's talk about how we confront at the highest level concentration of capital, and we talk about how we own our future, transform our future, and turn collective bargaining and organizing into a transformational campaign to radically reorganize the country, re uh, redistribute wealth and power, and make the labor movement and workers the center of doing that. Thanks a lot. Wow. So that was, that was very exciting for me. Um, I 
really learn, love listening to Jamie discuss how work is changing. Um, I really like this notion of kind of a system that's built on being overworked. Um, ben, I really appreciate it. You bring up kind of some subcontractors, the importance of solidarity, thinking about like materially how these tech companies exist and the space that they take up. Um, and uh, Alexandria, um, your stories were great. Um, and you know, you highlighted for us the shifting risk to individuals from corporations, um, and and how there are no longer workplace protections, and what that really means in the gig economy. Um, and Stephen, you brought us home with that was the timer, so you were well within time. Um, oh my God, I want my one minute back. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, you brought home this kind of rem reminder about focusing on the concentration of wealth and power is where we aim, uh, and thinking about fundamental transformation as a goal. Um, I like thinking of it as like a shift from collective bargaining to just collectives, right? So um, so I'm gonna start with a couple of questions and I'm gonna open it up to everyone here. Um, and I guess I'll go for the big question first, which is what, what role do you imagine unions um, and the labor mo movement really like kind of playing in the fight for workers' rights. So you talked a little bit about collective bargaining, but I, I think a little bit about Occupy, for example, and the way that I felt like the Occupy moment was this move of labor unions to be like, no, actually we need to be out in the streets, we need to be building with this particular class that's outside of the workers who, who we are supposed to be representing, but actually kind of help build this worker class and help build um, with activists who are kind of marching in the street and targeting the kind of millionaire, billionaire 1%. So, so yeah, so my question for all of you is like, how do you think of unions playing a role, um, particularly when you have stories where people are striking but don't imagine themselves as a union? Jamie, so we can, but you guys can pick up wherever, whoever wants to go first. So I think, um, I, I always struggle when we talk about unions as a kind of, if we say unions, because there are many, many different kinds of unions. Uh, and I think what we're beginning to see is a story that's been told over and over again, which is we should start with workers, not with unions, and we should see how workers are organizing and what kinds of organizations will fit what they need to do. And I think that's beginning to happen um, in, in a number of countries. There are kind of new, new ways of organizing. And I think the task for us is to think about what can those new forms of organizing learn from the old ones, and what bits can they kind of get rid of that don't help. Do you have a thought on what bits they can get rid of that don't help? <laughs> Lot, lots. Um, no, I, mean, I think you know, the traditions of, uh, of democracy and participation and so on, but then I think there are questions around what kinds of structures and how we treat paid staff, um, you know, the, the, the role of actual workers within the union. Uh, I think there are many bad examples, you know, both in the US and the UK of unions that act without the interest of workers in many ways. Yeah, I'd say when it comes to tech workers, the role of formal unions is, is kind of complicated because there are a number of these unions who are organizing service workers that we discussed, like cafeteria workers, shuttle bus drivers. When it comes to the so-called kind of white collar or technical roles, it's, it's been harder to, to break in, and that's a historical phenomenon. That's not, um, that's, that's not specific to our era. There, last year, there was a small uh, logistics company called uh, Linetics, where about a dozen software engineers at Linetics unionized and were promptly fired, actually, like the day before the union vote, and eventually took it before the National Labor Relations Board and over a kind of extended period of time won a, won a settlement. Um, but so far, I, I think we, we've seen, you know, most of the actions that I discussed in my, in my remarks have been workers acting without a formal union. Um, but many of them understand that even if you're not in a union, you are entitled to certain protections under the National Labor Relations Act. So I think you know, protected concerted activity has been a real conversation among tech workers, and, and I think it's an important one to continue about how do we use labor law to protect us as a shield uh, while probably not expecting a formal union to take shape in the near future, because I think that's a little bit further, further in the horizon for, for many of us. 
Um, you know, one of the issues that often comes up is people talk about, well, this is a temporary gig. People aren't going to be doing it for very long. But right now I'm actually beginning to do follow-up interviews with the gig workers that I interviewed in 2015. And I'm actually seeing that a number of them are still in the gig economy, especially people who thought, oh, this is a temporary thing. I'm just doing this for a couple of months. And so I think there's a good possibility there to reach out to people who've been sort of stuck doing this much longer than they thought. Um, and they're partly stuck doing it in words of one person, he's addicted to it because we know smartphones are addicting and then if you combine that with pings and money, it becomes even more addicting. Um, but I think that there's also a good possibility here for workers to organize and take advantage of social media. So we saw this with Instacart when workers started to publicize the fact that their tips were actually being used by the companies towards their salaries as opposed to as additional income and really being to harness not just the workers themselves but also the clients of the service and beginning to bring them into the larger discussion. And so I think there's a good possibility there for the workers to sort of have some instruction even by unions towards how to use social media in order to really draw attention to their plight. So, so part of what we're thinking about is if we have an analysis and understand which companies and corporations and how racialized capitalism operates, we can find common targets. So one of the things that we're looking a lot at, we're kicking off a campaign called Bargaining for Housing Justice. And you might say, what does that have to do with unions? But one of the pieces we're going to do is, one, look at all the things unions can do in bargaining that are about housing, not just for themselves, but their communities. So for example, the key, key drivers in Boston and many cities of gentrification are health care and universities. So how does that become of what people are bargaining? If a university expands, it has to build more housing. That, and, and then it goes to your question in the sense of what is our, not our symbolic or even our support of other groups, but how do we make it the same fight? we have the exact same person we're fighting. Blackstone, which is now, as I mentioned before, the largest landlord in America, we are gonna start forming a tenant union, tenants union of Blackstone tenants, and then trying to line up that, that bargaining, if we're able to force it, with the collective bargaining. And as a way to think about this, if we think about these companies that are operating in all spheres of our lives and extracting each one of them, then how do we have campaigns that are simultaneously happening targeting the same company. And I'll give you just one very specific example to reclaim my one minute. In Minnesota, <laughs> um, there was a campaign on Target. Some people may have, you know, the store. And simultaneously, they were organizing the janitors that clean Target. They were also organizing to ban the box. You know, they're asking about criminal records. And also about they're getting tax cuts to create jobs, which they didn't create. Those three campaigns happened simultaneously, which then meant you could scale the work in a different kind of way. You had greater capacity. So they didn't try to convince the janitor's union to do the work around Ban the Box. They said, we're each going to do our campaign, but we're going to focus on the same actor that's incredibly powerful. And not only did they win the three campaigns, but the critical thing that happened is when Target agreed to Ban the Box, it then went to the Chamber of Commerce and said they had to be neutral on the state legislation because Target was now disadvantaged because they were the only major corporation. And so they were able to win a legislative flight fight because they split the key corporate actors. So to me on the question is there's a, a, a knee-jerk reaction among unions, which is, oh, we need to add a solidarity to sort of in our spare time help other groups. And that's a nice thing. But what we're trying to develop is the idea that it's actually the exact same fight because we're fighting the exact same people and we're each effect going after them in different ways, which lets the work get big enough and then starts to get into this discussion about why all these different people, the same people are controlling all parts of our life, most of whom don't pay taxes, most of whom are subsidized by the federal government. But I just want to tell one funny story that goes back to what you were saying. When my grandmother came to this country, she was an a garment worker, and she was an industrial home worker. She would pick up work and take it home. And I always thought if the gig economy had existed then, if she had a smartphone, she would have been an innovative person. Instead of just going to the factory to pick up the garments that she would then sew at home, it would have been on her fart smartphone. And she would have gone to the factory and picked up, oh, it's the same thing. I'm just really agreeing. And, and I also have um, some family, family members who are sharecroppers in the South. And again, none of this is new. The question is, though, that at the top it's more concentrated. So the irony is that we may, the very thing that makes it powerful, 
makes it easier, easier for us to challenge it because all of our fights are more intertwined because it's the same actors that are on the top. Yeah, it feels more dispersed, but it's not really. Exactly. My grandmother was also a garment worker. Um, I, Should we sing? Look yeah, for well, the we'll sing song. afterwards. Okay. afterwards. <laughs> um, I really like the link between technology and overwork. I think about this often in the academy because you would think, like, the amount of books and articles, for example, that are required for like tenure nowadays is much higher than it would have been in like the 1970s, 1969, 1960s, when incidentally the professor it was whiter and more male. Um, but but it's something about the rate of technology that has kind of increased, right? Like this idea that we can get we can think, get things from Google Scholar and we can get things from archives much easier. And so there's an expectation that goes higher um, instead of like rethinking fundamentally what it means to be a professor and saying, well, actually, maybe we should make more time for these other things as opposed to, you know, demanding more time for publishing in this particular way. So I, I like kind of thinking about technology and overwork and the ways we all are kind of implicated in, in this system all the time. Um, I want to ask my own question and then we will go to the audience. The, my final question is thinking about the biases that are built in. So when we all went to Prague last year, ICA, there were a couple of us, um, namely me, as far as I'm concerned, that could not get an Uber, right? Like they would, they would reject anyone that they saw were black to the extent that we had to start asking white colleagues to order cars for us so we could get around the city, um, or we would, or get stranded. Actually, a couple of us got stranded in various parts of Prague, um, and so I'm thinking about not just kind of the discrimination of the workplaces or like, but also workplace protections that, you know, the part of the civil rights movement was pushing back and Woolworth's counters, right? Being able to say, I should be able to access these spaces. And, and this is often a fight you hear around Airbnbs and, you know, the ways in which users are experiencing discrimination. So I'm wondering, um, I guess about how you all are thinking about that in terms of this fight, in terms of um, the ability for for the the workers themselves to kind of participate in discrimination against users, um, or even vice versa. I mean, I know you kind of ticked on a little bit when you talked about sexual harassment in the work, but yeah, I'm wondering about the kind of that space. Yeah, um, so in Hustling Gig, I actually divide workers into three categories of strugglers, strivers, and success stories. And the strugglers are individuals who have turned to the gig economy in sort of a moment of desperation. Um, and then the success stories are the ones that are able to have sort of that life that everyone wants. You know, they are the entrepreneurs. They're usually involved in having little Airbnb empires. And then the strivers are sort of in the middle. Um, and I very much see that race and ethnicity and immigration status really plays a role here in terms of who the strugglers are and also in terms of the types of risks that they encounter. So I don't think that it's an accident that my chapter that talks about criminal activity, all of the individuals who get involved in criminal activity, with the exception of the people doing the uh, illegal Airbnbs, are all workers of color. Um, whether a young Asian woman who finds herself involved in what appears to be a money laundering scheme, <laughs> um, or at least some type of like Western Union scam, all the way up to the Uber driver who's doing accidental drug deliveries, um, or the po um, Uber Eats guy who actually finds himself getting asked to deliver marijuana, which is not legal in New York City at that time, or now-ish. Um, so there's definitely that aspect to it. Um, but what I actually see in terms of sort of discrimination comes up more with the um, Airbnb hosts. And they, um, especially the ones that have corporations that have actually incorporated their Airbnb hosting, are more likely to discriminate um, on the basis of race and ethnicity. And that's partly because they want to hide their empires. And New York City is a very segregated place. And so people will say, well, I'm not discriminating on race. It's just, you know, someone who's of a different color will stick out in that apartment building. And so I can't really rent to them because it'll be very obvious what I'm doing. Um, and there's actually a fascinating component where, um, although we often hear about discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, Airbnb hosts, at least of the ones I interviewed, love renting to gay men um, because they think that they will clean their houses and possibly redecorate it while they're there, um, which is fantastic as far as they're concerned. And they think they don't have children, I would imagine. Yes, well. and children are definitely not something you want to rent to, apparently. So. 
Um, okay, so. Can, uh, can I just. Oh, yeah. I, I just want to throw one thing, which is I think there's a way to look at this from the top down and the bottom up, which is if you look, you know, we all use it for, we don't all use it, a small group of us talk about financialization and financialized capitalism. And so one, if we look at that, it's primarily built on extraction of wealth from communities of color. I mean, that's the business model from subprime to redlining. It's, we won't do the history, and it's core to almost everything happening in the economy now. So if we, on the one hand, if we recognize that, then it lets us think about a lot of the things that are individual as part of not just individual, you know, things that make you furious and are horrible, but are system, you know, part of systems. And so again, in bargaining for common good, we've created pages of bargaining language that you can now bargain, for example, that the police on campus will not, uh, how you bargain the role of police on campus and how they police neighborhood kids who no longer can get from their home to the school bus without going across the campus. So I, I think what's important is connecting it and you know, a lot of the work we're doing in bargaining for common good and the popular education is trying to center what, you know, what we would call racialized capitalism and how it operates at every level and then it exacerbates all those kinds of things. So I just wanted to throw out that I think we can connect the, the big picture with how people experience it individually. Okay, great. Daphne. Well, thank you very much for a fantastic panel. And I actually just want to follow up on the comment you made. Um, given that we are in a university environment, I'm wondering about your thought, if you have any, and Tom, maybe you can join that, uh, that answer could be for you too, about uh, the phenomena, the growing phenomena of part time lecturers, adjunct lecturers, as part of the seeing it as part of the general analysis of the gig economy. And I wonder if you have anything that you would like to say about that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I was an adjunct for more than a decade, and I taught for more than two dozen schools in that decade. Um, and I think that the, and now I'm a tenure track professor, uh, against all the odds. Um, yes, I've been on both sides of that. Um, I think that the rise of uh, the adjunctification of higher education is part of this sort of risk transformation um, where the schools no want no longer want to have the risk of oh I might not have you know I might not have students to have this class so I'm just going to put all the risk on the underpaid lecturer who has no workplace stability from one day to another um, and who has no protections or leave um, so that they can go and do other aspects um, and I think that this is you know universities. Um, Universities have an option to be thought leaders on this and to really make transformation. And I think we need to start seeing some of that transformation and sort of be good role models, if you will, in order to sort of make change in other places. Um, I'm uh, slightly, the school where I teach full time, Mercy College, is actually beginning a union drive right now. Um, and it'll be very interesting to see how that ends up playing out. They've recently announced that they're upping salaries which they haven't done in years, just as they sent out the, like, by the way, your ballot is due. Um, yeah. Um, so I think we, we should definitely be paying more attention to that. Um, but I also think that, um, yeah, we need to be paying more attention to that and really fighting for our part-time professors. And I would, not to be a broken record, but I am one. Um, you know, there was a study done that looked at the boards of, uh, or board of trustees of universities and nonprofits over the last 30 years, and it showed that the majority of people at most university boards are now out of finance, or fire, finance, real estate, and insurance. And so one is the sort of the generic financialization. My wife's at Rutgers, she has to raise part of her own salary, all that. But we can't separate it from the people on the boards of many of the big public universities and all pr private ones are the same companies that don't pay taxes. So then they are actually the participants in why there's less money going to these universities because they're defunding. And then their solution, of course, is the same solution they have in the companies they own, which is to part-time, gig, outsource, et cetera. So it's, I think that like in all these things, we can't separate it from the larger trends in the economy. And I, Somebody here probably knows a figure what I think Rutgers budgets down state used to be 80% state funded and is now 25%. And the expression the Chicago teachers have coined, which I think is really a great summary of this, they call it broke on purpose, which mm -hmm. is you first lower the taxes of corporations so that 
it supposedly will stimulate the economy. There's then, and then you simultaneously lower wages to stimulate the economy. So then there's less tax revenue. So then the company, the same bank that's benefiting from the tax cut says, I'll loan you money. And then they make money loaning money to the entity they just bankrupted. And then they say, well, there is no money, so we have to be rational, so we have to implement austerity. And then when the debt gets big, like in Puerto Rico or Detroit, they say, oh, these people, they can't manage their own democracy. We need now that we bankrupted and extracted all the way wealth to get rid of democracy and then have a control board come in and make all the decisions. So I think, like on a lot of this, it's, it, it's, it, it's all intertwined. And on the, on the higher ed sector, it's sort of extraordinary how much the very people that run the universities are complicit in defunding their entities. Yeah, um, and there was a really beautiful piece in The Atlantic this week on a woman named Thea Hunter called uh, The Death of an Adjunct that, if you haven't checked it out yet, um, is definitely worth reading. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, Aaron. Um, I love the idea of the bargaining for common good. Um, I guess what I'm wondering is, do, is there, does it, is there a way in which that's sort of like putting too much on the workers who are already struggling to, you know, do collective bargaining in the first place? You know, it, it's interesting because this comes up all the way. Like you're making a choice, and our experience has been that I'll give you an example. In LA, in LA right at, during the height of the recession, they came for all these concessions. And the traditional union battle would be to fight off the concessions. We did the opposite. We loaded up with dozens of other demands that people cared about. And here's, here's another way to look at it, is what the employers have done a brilliant job of is narrowing what unions can bargain around and then saying, aren't they greedy and selfish? So legally, we say school teachers aren't supposed to bargain about class size. Timer, sorry. I, let me just finish the thought. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. I am very disciplined. Yes. But anyway, so that what they do is they narrow what you legally can bar bargain about, and then they attack you for being narrow. So. I think it's, it's a false choice, which people raise this all the time. Am I giving up my raise to bargain over these other things? I don't think we can win raises unless we build a much broader movement. And we can't build a much broader movement unless people feel it deeply ingrained in the bargaining process and organizing process that matters to their lives. And it has really been amazing. Um, you should read this woman, Sarah Jaffe's articles, um, <laughs> about the LA teachers strike. It's about how transformational it was for students, parents, and teachers not to be in the trap that this is about, do I get a 6% or an 8% raise? This is about how we build an LA where people can learn, where students can thrive, and people can love, teachers love what they're doing. The head of the Massachusetts teacher has this, you know, has a great saying. She says, we are bargaining for joy. We are bargaining for joy as teachers. We're bargaining for joy as parents. We're bargaining for joy in our communities. And that's what education's about. You can't do that if you let them trick you into saying, this is just about your pension. Thanks. Um, ben and Jamie, I didn't know if you, I saw you both nodding. I didn't know if you want to add anything before we head out. Sure, yeah, I, I would say that, you know, let's see, tension between kind of particularism and this like more solidaristic way of thinking is very alive in these tech worker movements as well. A common uh, criticism or response to some of these mobilizations has been, well, if tech workers have a union, particularly, let's say, the, the kind of uh, elite tech worker within within Google, won't they just get even more money? You know, won't they get even more ping pong tables or kombucha taps? <laughs> um, and, you know, the answer is always, well, maybe. And, and I think as Stephen has pointed out, the structure of the kind of labor law regime that we have in this country uh, in incentivizes workers to pursue those narrow goals. But I think as Stephen also mentioned in his remarks, the labor movement is rooted in these, in these much broader ideas of democracy and self-determination. And what's inspiring, and this takes a lot of political and ideological struggle, is for people to plug into that by developing these relationships outside of their workplace. Um, so I think that's been inspiring to watch. But I'd say the, these tensions, again, are, are alive, and it will take struggle to, to overcome them. Yeah, I, I guess just a, a final thought. I mean, I think the, the ideas that we've spoken about on the panel, I think, are also part of having uh, a vision uh, about what's possible. Uh, and I think for so long that vision has been either incredibly narrow and economistic or been incredibly electoral. Um, and I think we have to think about when we ask these questions about the future of workers, you know, about the union and about workers, is about having a vision of how that can tie in with a much broader transformation of society. 
Because whether you speak to gig workers in the UK, the US, and, and, and elsewhere, people don't just want to talk about the very immediate things. They want to talk about their futures, and they want to talk about how they can reshape society. Uh, and I think what's important is that we can also say that whilst we can do many, many things, we do still have power in the workplace, and that those challenges for control can be central to how we also transform society. Yeah, I like leaving it on a note of thinking about this as a global collective struggle. So um, I'm going to keep fantasizing about robots that grade my papers and um, and thinking about how my grandmother did know how to do that VCR timer, by the way. Yeah, but um, I appreciate you all. Thank you so much. Please, let's give them a round of applause.